Good morning. I would ask that you take your Bibles and turn them to the book of James, chapter 1. And as we do, I would say the last time I preached, I received a call that said, well, your sermon was pretty good, but I think you need to smile more to emphasize your points. So here you go, Scott. Um, uh, you're welcome. As we get started this morning, before we look at this passage, and don't worry, Sharon, I will read the first Peter passage as well. Things don't always go as planned, do they? Um, <laughs> I would like to talk about a deception that I think exists in the world that we live in, and it's one that we need to be very cautious of, and I would say cognizant of all the time because it's a very insidious deception. We, we see it a lot. And I, I know I'm starting this uh, sermon with a conversation about deception. It sounds like, this is really negative. Aren't we supposed to be talking about joy? You'll see where I'm going with this. But this deception takes place if we turn on our TV and we see that we are truly blessed when things are going well for us. And we, we look at that and we go, well, a, a mark of blessing for me might be to own a Rolls Royce or maybe to own a really large house. Or a mark of blessing for me might be to have um, good health. Or maybe a mark of blessing might be to have a good education. Or maybe a mark of blessing for me might be to have teenagers that aren't rebellious. Amen. That's a rarity. Um, so we look at these things and we go, man, if that's, that's blessing there. So having a nice car is a blessing. And then we turn on the TV and maybe we find certain preachers who will say something like, if you're in God's favor, God is going to richly reward you. You're going to have these nice things. Of course, that's always followed up by send me a check. And we look at that stuff and we go, that is so disconnected from reality. That is such a deception to say that God's blessing is tied to our earthly rewards. To say, I'm going to get a nice card, that shows that God loves me. Or I'm going to have nice health, that shows that God loves me. But the problem is that deception does not always come from the outside. Because we can say, well, I, I don't agree with the, the Joel Olsteins who say best life now, because if, if this is your best life now, you got problems. I don't agree with the, the Kenneth Copelands who at the beginning of the COVID-19 issue made a video of, of blowing on the microphone and say, I blow the wind on you, COVID-19. I look at that stuff and I go, well, most people at Stanfield Baptist, they're not going to get taken in by that kind of material. But where it really becomes a little more insidious is when we tell ourselves that maybe God's angry with me. Or maybe I'm not in the best of favor with God because I have poor health. Or because I don't have a nice car. We deceive ourselves because the moment a problem happens in our life, our first response is, what am I doing to bring this material or this issue on my life? Personally, I just experienced this on Thursday night. <laughs> As I called Maggie, and I, she told me that we had some plumbing problems. That night, sitting on my porch, I remember telling Maggie that I'm really not happy with the concept of home ownership anymore. <laughs> and I was trying to evaluate, like, what is going on? There was other things, too. It wasn't just that. We'd also found out that our daughter-in-law potentially has a more serious health issue than the one she's been diagnosed with. 
We've been praying for a friend of Johanna's and we're looking, I'm, I'm looking, I can't say for Maggie, but I'm looking and we internalize this and we're like, or I'm like, what is going on? Then I started thinking when you have, you know, plumbing problems, what a first world issue that truly is, isn't it? I mean, because if you lived, you know, we, we talked about this church in the Philippines. The plumbing problems I have wouldn't even exist down there. So, but I'm, I'm thinking, I got to preach this sermon to myself when I read what James has to say. So now that you have your Bibles open to James chapter 1, I want to read what James says. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Would you pray with me? Father God, Lord, as... We come before you to open your holy word. It is my prayer, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning. That we as your people would be ministered to by your Holy Spirit. That you would walk amongst us. And you would take the words of a feeble old man. And use them for your glory. That you would enrich the hearts of your people. And that we would be encouraged by the truths we find in your holy word. So Lord, we pray that you are present with us this morning in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That seems counterintuitive. When you experience these struggles, you experience these trials, you experience hardship. Whether you hear you hear somebody assaulted for the sake of Christ or whether you go to the doctor and you're diagnosed with cancer or in a time of COVID you, maybe you get the COVID diagnosis and and you're worried about your health, and you're worried about the health of the loved ones around you. These are trials. Or maybe you're worried about your job. Or maybe you look at the politics of the day. I saw we have the political thing out there to help you decide how to vote on stuff. And you, you, you look at November 3rd, I think it's November 3rd, and you're like, what's gonna happen to our country? Is, is Portland going to burn? Did somebody say yes? <laughs> or or we, we go, well, what's going to happen? And we're, we're struggling with this. And we're like, well, how is God at work? Well, the nice thing is, November 3rd is going to come. November 3rd is going to go. And we're going to get up on the morning of November 4th. The sun's going to come up and the sun's going to go down. And God will still be on his throne in heaven. So when we experience these trials, these struggles that are extremely close and personal. You know, I was reminded of this yesterday. I was talking to the plumber that was working on our house. And he had been there a couple hours already. He was there till what, 9 o'clock last night? He asked me for a couple grocery bags. And I'm like, okay. So I went and grabbed some, you know, we saved the Walmart bags. And I brought them to him. I said, well, what do you need this for? He's like, well, I cut off my finger yesterday and I want to keep it covered up. <laughs> yeah, he was working the day after cutting his finger off. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, this guy's got some struggles. And then in talking to him, I found out that his wife has ovarian cancer. And I'm thinking, and you're in my basement at 8 o'clock at night? Those are true and, and real struggles. And James tells us to count it all joy. 
in the midst of those kind of struggles. And my question is, how do you do that? The way you do that is perspective. James is, is leading us into this perspective. So whether our, our health is bad, or maybe our relationships are bad. In these politics, maybe you're looking at uh, maybe a relationship that is kind of fractured because you have a different perspective and the person that you love doesn't like what your perspective is. Or maybe you're experiencing persecution for the sake of Christ. By the way, that is a real thing in our day and age. Maybe not so much in America, but persecution outside of America is a reality. Persecution inside of America for your faith is becoming a reality. And when we look at those things, we often lament how things used to be. Because if, if someone comes up and says a slanderous thing against me, I'm going to wish for the time when that wasn't happening. James says, count it all joy. I do want to read to you a passage out of the book of Acts. And I am going to want you to go to several different places this morning. But in Acts chapter 5, you have a, a picture of response to persecution. So Peter and John have been preaching and they've been called before the, the religious leaders. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 27, it says, And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand and as leader and savior to him to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. We must obey God rather than men. At some point in endeavoring to obey God rather than men, we will come up against the reality that some men hate God. And in that hating God, they will attack us. So that becomes a very real persecution becomes a very real trial and James says count it all joy. But he says that when you count it joy it's because it's doing something. So he says count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So years ago we were we had a travel trailer at the time and we took that trailer and we drove down to Bardstown, Kentucky. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the other day it came up on Facebook. They remind you of everything. And we drove down to Bardstown, Kentucky because John, our oldest son, was graduating from basic training at Fort Knox. This was when Fort Knox would still have their basic training take place there. So John went down to Fort Knox two months prior to this. John had an experience at Fort Knox because basic training is an experience. When you first show up, they are very, should I say, not kind. They have them do push-ups. They have them run. And nothing they do is right. Every discussion with the drill sergeant somehow gets twisted so that you're doing push-ups or you're doing sit-ups, or you're running. John got in trouble because they assigned him what was called a battle buddy. A battle buddy is your partner in basic training. And your battle buddy is never to leave your side. And when I say never, the army means never. John got separated from his battle buddy. John was worried he was going to get kicked out of the army because he got separated from his battle buddy. 
That's how serious the army takes their training. And they integrate that training to everything that John would do. So by the time those two months had passed, he was ready to graduate basic training. Became a U.S. soldier. And so we went down to celebrate that with him. You know what John does these days? John is still in the army. John still goes to training. Because after basic training, John had to go to AIT, which is advanced training. And John went to continual training. Do you know what that training was training him for? For the real thing. So one time, John went to Afghanistan. He lived in Afghanistan for a year. And I can tell you, for parents, that was a very hard year. For his wife, that was a very hard year. John applied his training in combat. John came back. You know what John does now? He trains. Every time we call him, well, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going to training. Going to the field. It's ongoing. James is applying that same concept to the Christian walk. See, when we become Christians, we think that everything is going to be sunshine and roses. And we tell ourselves that. We, we really do. Or worse yet, that becomes the evangelistic message. Come to Jesus and everything will be fine. You know, I sat down the other day and I, I, when, when I get stressed, I get sentimental. So the other day I popped in the Wizard of Oz. And I'm watching that. And, you know, of course, you know, you have the, these concepts of Dorothy going into this fantasy land where she gets tied up with, with representatives of wisdom, of courage, and compassion. And she travels with them. And they go through the, the poppy fields and she's helped along by, by the good witch. But then when she gets to the Emerald City, you're thinking, well, everything's going to be great. That's kind of like, you know, when we become a Christian, we think everything's going to be great. Now all of a sudden, what's going on? She's looking up in the sky and the witch is burning stuff in the sky and, and she has to go kill the witch. Her trials did not end. Our trials in this life don't end. Our trials are preparing us for glory. Our trials are preparing us to be steadfast in the face of persecution, in the face of health struggles. And so James says that, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And so when we as Christians engage in the Christian walk, we cannot fall into that deception that, that, that we, we would say, well, when I experience hardship, man, God must be mad at me. Scott, when you had back problems, was God mad at you because you had back problems? Or how about this? Let's look back in the Old Testament. Job, a great example of somebody who loved and honored God. And Job was cursed with something that I would not wish on my worst enemy. Boils. God allowed Satan to take his kids. He allowed him to take his wealth. And he took his health and covered him in boils. And Job is sitting in dust and ashes. And he refuses to condemn God. Because he has a steadfast faith. Or how about Joseph? Joseph, who is, he's on the fast track to doing something right, to, doing, to, to getting a lot of success in his life. God is saying, or, well, God through these dreams says, you're going to be in charge of your brothers. God through these dreams says, you're going to be in charge of your entire family. And then they go out to the field. He goes to find his brothers. His brothers take him and chuck him into a pit, strip his coat off, covered in blood, and they sell him into slavery. And then he starts to be successful again. And he starts to be successful by, by doing the right thing. By being a man of virtue. And what does that get him? 
gets him accused of attempted rape and thrown into prison. Things don't go well for Joseph for a very long time. And then eventually Joseph is put into a place of authority. And God says it was all so that the lives of your people would be saved. Trials come our way. Trials are difficult. If you get a cancer diagnosis, you're getting a cancer diagnosis. It's not something light. If you have poor health, it's not something light. Persecution is not something light. But it's all in the now. And so James, when he says that trials produce steadfastness, he says trials prepare us for these things. How do we have joy in the midst of those trials? And I think it's by having an eternal perspective. Look at the next thing that James says. He says, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so I think James is telling us to have an eternal perspective on a temporal situation. So as we're struggling with something as trite as a plumbing issue or something as serious as cancer, we should be able to recognize these are some serious things that we're dealing with. But my perspective is rooted not in the now, not in the temporal, but in eternity. And so one day, I may not be comfortable today, but one day I will stand in the presence of my Lord and my Savior for eternity. One day I'll be shed of this body of sin. And I will stand in the presence of my Lord and Savior for eternity. And so I would say that to be able to count it all joy in the midst of suffering and in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of trials, is rooted in our perspective. Because if you are here today, most likely you are experiencing some version of a trial. If you're not, I would say just wait. Um... But it's a matter of perspective. Are you in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? Think about it for a moment. Does it just mean something like you, let's say, at, at the age of 12, and you say a prayer, oh, well, here's my story. At the age of 17, we were living in Hermiston, Oregon, and I got handed some tickets to a concert. I might have told you some of this. But I got handed some tickets to go to a Christian concert. And I'm like, I don't want to go to a Christian concert. Then I found out it wasn't just a Christian concert. It was a Christian punk rock concert. So you take two things that I really didn't want any involvement with. But I was given free tickets. My family, we were moving to Springfield, Oregon the next day. So I actually signed out of all my schools or all my classes and and by the way some of you know Rod Vergato he's the one that gave me the tickets so I kind of blame him um, went and it was absolutely the worst music I've ever heard just bar none the worst music I ever heard was this Christian punk music holy 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 does not sound right as punk music but at the end there was an altar call and somehow I ended up standing up there at the front of the stage. Praise the Lord, but that is not my way. <laughs> I was up there. I accepted Jesus. And then after that, I went on to, of course, try to read my Bible and do all the stuff you're supposed to do. By the age of 18, I was in the army. I got kicked out of the army. And... By the age of, this is where my mind leaves me. Either I was 20 or 21, I met Maggie. We got married. And I think it was over the next four or five years that I started 
developing more of a relationship with God. Is that moment where I came forward the moment where all my problems ceased? Or maybe it was that moment when Maggie and I started attending church in Stanfield and we sat over in the older sanctuary and we say, well, that's where the problems cease? Or is it as we come closer to our, in our relationship with Christ that we recognize that birth in our hearts is new life. And as that new life starts to grow in our hearts through the work of Jesus Christ, we become more affectionate to what God is doing. And we become filled with desire to know God. And then we recognize that God sent his son in order that we would know him. And that creates new life for us. God's son's a primary example of somebody who experienced trial and persecution to the point of death. And so, for the sake of what was set before him, Jesus Christ endured the cross. And now we look at our life and we say, it's for the sake of the gospel that I can endure persecution. I can endure poor health because I know that I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ because he has created new life in me. And that life will find its culmination not in this life, not in my health now, but this, this new life will find its culmination when I enter into the presence of God my Savior through the work of Jesus Christ. And I stand in his presence for all eternity singing his praise. And so yes, we can count it all joy when we endure suffering. When we endure hardship. When we endure persecution. When our plumbing doesn't work. When, when we see problems in our family. When we're estranged from our family and we say, I can still have joy in the midst of my sorrows. I still move forward. I get up in the morning and I put my shoes on and I look to the work of Christ in my life. That's how we count it all joy because Christ is working perfection in us. Because one day, each one of us, unless God returns, is going to move from the cradle to the grave. Each one of us at some point will lay our head down in death. Now, we can say that's a negative thing or we can say that's a positive thing. The other thing that came up on Facebook that Maggie reminded me of, I think it was just yesterday, was, what was it, three or, no, it was like five years ago I had shoulder surgery, and then I had shoulder surgery, and then that shoulder surgery got infected, and so then I had a third one. And I remember going into my surgery, because it had gotten infected, thinking I wasn't going to make it out of the surgery. And then I remember waking up, and do you know what my first sight was? Scott's face. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, man. Because <laughs> I know where my hope is. Do you? Where is your hope? Where, where are you looking to find your rest? Is it in success? Success is fleeting. Just read all these leadership books. They'll tell you to, to, to think better thoughts, to manifest your reality. It's not in health. Like I said, none of us are going to get out of here alive. We got to look to the gospel for the place of our joy. That gospel will lead us to Christ. Christ 
will introduce us to God. And then we stand in his presence forever. I do want to read that first Peter passage to you. Because I do think it was an important one. Because at the end of the day, we don't know what tomorrow looks like. But we do know what eternity looks like. We don't, we don't shirk from struggles. We don't shirk from strife. And Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? Beloved, we have got to look to the gospel to find our hope. So that deception that I mentioned earlier is a deception that we tell ourselves. But we've got to look beyond that. As we deal with the pain of the current situation, we need to look for hope in the gospel. We will not find hope anywhere else. Whether it's a presidential election, or a governor election, or we're looking at ballot measures, or we're looking at the words of a doctor. I would challenge you to take a look around this room. Do it. Literally, look at the people that are next to you. Every one of them. Or maybe behind you, in front of you. Each person there is somebody who is experiencing some version of a trial. We are brothers, we are sisters, we are mothers, we are fathers. We are here because Christ has called us here. We are here in the midst of sorrow, maybe grieving over a loved one. We are here in the midst of sickness. We are here in the midst of persecution, political strife. And yet, God has given us hope. A glorious hope in the future. God has given us a faith that is stronger than anything we can encounter. And when we ask the question, what makes church relevant? Why do we even meet? We meet because as brothers and sisters, we can embrace each other in the midst of our sorrow and say, brother, let me walk with you a little bit. Sister, let me share your burden. Let me share some of my joy with you because I know you're hurting today. This is why church has value. Church is relevant because this is the only place through this, the Holy Word of God, that we can come into contact with the Word of God. You can't do it on your own. And so church is relevant. Even in the day and age of YouTube and Facebook and all of that, church has relevance because it is only when we come into contact with each other that we walk and share each other's burdens. I'm going to close with a quote from somebody named Thomas Watson. I came across this quote the other day, and I think it has value as we think about suffering and joy. And he says that Christianity is not the removal of suffering, 
but the addition of grace to endure suffering triumphantly. So as we walk through this world, we will have struggles, we will have trials. And we are called to count it all joy. Because we live not out of the reality of what we experience during the day, but out of the reality of the future that God has planned for us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how he has laid upon us his grace, his mercy, and he calls us his children. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I just thank you for the grace that you have shown us by giving us your son. I pray, Lord, that it is with him that we would walk. That we would look to your son, Jesus Christ, as our savior, as our brother, as our friend. And that we would give glory to you in that. One day, Lord, as we do shed our mortal coils, I pray that we enter into your holy realm, perfect and complete, and lay our, our crowns at your feet. And we forever call you Father and King. Lord, I pray that that is the hope that guides us. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And jump in when you can. It's new. These words are beautiful. Eric. Please stand and join us as we do sing our closing song.
I didn't discuss any closing of this service. Was there a different plan? No, you've got the plan. Okay. Well, I want to thank James for uh, preaching this morning. It made me think back um, 